Excellent. We're live on YouTube and on Facebook. I just want to check if we're actually live on our social platforms. Give Facebook a chance to kind of alert folks that have this as a reminder that we are on and we're getting ready. If you are hopping on right now and um, see us and can hear us fine, please make sure that you go ahead and give us that thumbs up so we know that we're good to go and get started. I know it's a lot of great information that our Senator would like to share, so I don't wanna hoard up too much time. Perfect, and it looks like I see Parker Brown. Hello to you, Parker from Carabas, and Wayne Anderson. Um, and Wayne already beat me to the comment portion. Good morning to you as well. Thank you uh, to Senator Zenzinger for taking the time to give us this update. So good morning, everyone, and happy Friday. We are at the end of the week and right before a holiday. I know several people are probably hitting the road or starting to travel. The great thing is that you have internet almost anywhere and can be streaming this live. Um, as you all are aware, we have these videos on a daily basis at 11 o'clock to help guide our businesses through the process of uncertain times and hear updates from both our electeds, uh, various members of our city, county, or uh, federal administrations as well. All the videos are available to you to find here on our Facebook page. They're also synced onto our YouTube page and at our Westminster Chamber COVID resource page that's available to you at any point in time. If it is your first time watching our broadcast, please make sure that you like our page, that you hit that notification button so that you get alerted when we're on here for timely updates, and that you share the content with people that you think may benefit from some of the information that we have out there. Lastly, for my housekeeping items, we are available on all social media platforms. So find us on Instagram and Twitter at Westie Chamber, again, here on Facebook and YouTube with our website at westminsterchamber.biz. I'm pleased to bring you today Senator Rachel Zensinger. As you all are aware, we're situated on Adams and Jefferson County, which means that we're doubly blessed with senators um, representing both our reporters, at least actually three. I had uh, with us at one point Senator Morano, who covers a tiny bit of Westminster, uh, Senator Faith Winter very early on. We've had Representative Tracy Crothlarp and Shannon Bird. And so um, in line with that, I know Senator Zensinger was really amping up for the uh, legislative session to reconvene. So what we were able to get this more in terms of a recap and hear everything that we should be mindful of or things that they were able to implement over the last couple of weeks that they've met. Senator Zenzinger is spending um, this next half hour with us. If you have questions or comments, as Wayne has already done, please post them into the comment section of this broadcast. We'll take up questions at the end. And if we run out of time, I'll make sure to get those questions to our senator and try and bring you back and answer in a, in a timely manner. So with that being said, I will go ahead and mute myself, Senator Zenzinger, it is all yours. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it, Juliet. And uh, thank you to everybody that's tuning in today too. It's my pleasure. I was planning on being on this uh, broadcast a little bit sooner than uh, today, but at the very moment in which um, I was invited to, to participate, I was actually pretty deeply involved in uh, trying to reconfigure our state budget. So I am State Senator Rachel Zenzinger. I represent Senate District 19, which is Arvada and Westminster, all in Jefferson County. And um, the Senate districts are slightly larger than our House districts. So my Senate district uh, has encompasses two House districts, House District 27, which is represented by uh, Brianna Titone, and House District 29, which is represented by Tracy Kraftart. Uh, I sit on the Joint Budget Committee. The Joint Budget Committee is a committee that's comprised of both House and Senate members. It's the only committee that meets during the legislative session uh, that um, 
is comprised of both chambers other than some of our non-committees of reference. So we do have, for example, an audit committee that's made up of, of both members. And we have a fair number of um, smaller committees. For example, I'm also the vice chair of the statutory revision committee, which is made up of both House and Senate members. But the majority of your committees, uh, your committees of reference, the committees that hear bills that come to those committees um, to to hear and uh, make recommendations on various bills are either House committees or Senate committees. Um, and I serve on the Joint Budget Committee, which is uh, comprised of both. We have six members, three members from the House, three members from the Senate, and the chairmanship of that particular committee switches back and forth every year between the House and the Senate. Last year, you had uh, Senator Dominic Moreno on your, your broadcast a few weeks ago. And last year, Senator Moreno was the chair of the Joint Budget Committee. And this year, it was the House that was chairing the Joint Budget Committee. So it was Representative Denea Escar. Because of that, all of the bills that were affiliated with the budget, as well as the budget itself, all started in the House this year. And so they all uh, will have House bill numbers. House bill numbers are HB 20 for the year 2020, and then followed by four digits. Senate bills are SB for Senate bill 20 for the year, followed by three numbers. So that's a little tip to be able to tell the difference between House and Senate bills. This session really was, um, Oh, and I'm, I'm sorry, I, I meant to also uh, bring up that the one of the good things about the Joint Budget Committee, one of the things that I actually treasure about it is that it's actually bipartisan as well. So we have um, two members uh, from the minority party, one senator, Senator Bob Rankin, and uh, one House member, uh, Representative Kim Ransom, um, that are also on the Joint Budget Committee. And traditionally, the Joint Budget Committee works very collaboratively. Um, and I think that we did that this year in particular. Also, in order for a bill to be a Joint Budget Committee bill, you have to have unanimous approval which is part of the reason why I think we have so much um, cooperation among the Joint Budget Committee members is that we are not allowed to introduce a bill from the Joint Budget Committee without all six members agreeing to it. So this particular session really was kind of a tale of two sessions. Uh, we had our pre-coronavirus session, which was clipping along at a great pace and uh, pretty productive. Um, I had a bill uh, with um, a co-sponsor from um, my colleagues from across the aisle with every member of the Republican caucus. Um, we were going along great. And um, then in, in the beginning of March is when we first um, heard about COVID entering into our state. And then we went on um, a 10 week pause uh, for uh, COVID related reasons. During that 10 weeks, however, I will let you know that as a member of the Joint Budget Committee, my world really turned upside down. Um, at the beginning from our January forecast, we had approximately $800 million um, extra to spend on priorities and um, important uh, projects or programs. And then uh, the, the second week of March, when we had our uh, March revenue forecast, we were down to about $30 million to spend. So we went from 800 million down to 30. And then about two weeks later, we went in the hole, $3.3 billion. So um, in Colorado, we have a balanced budget amendment uh, in our constitution. So we are not allowed to spend more than we have. So we had to go through the process of uh, reprioritizing and redoing our state budget. Uh, when we came to that point, we were approximately 98% finished with the state budget uh, when uh, COVID-19 happened. And so we had to uh, actually adjust for that 800 million um, that we had already accounted for in our budget. We had to reduce that back down to, um, to get us to zero. And then 
in addition to that, we had to reduce it another $3.3 billion. So it was um, the worst recession. It was the worst uh, reduction in budget revenue that our state has ever seen. And in fact, it was greater than all of our prior recessions combined. 3.3 uh, billion makes up approximately um, 25 percent of our general fund revenues. And so we had to eliminate a quarter of our state budget. Um, and we only had approximately a three week time period to do that in order to prepare the budget for introduction for our colleagues when uh, they returned to the, to the uh, legislature. Um, it was a pretty difficult task. Uh, we had a couple of priorities that we had set out uh, to begin with, which one is to make sure that we really prioritize those essential state programs, uh, in particular those programs around health and safety. Uh, we also tried really hard to prioritize education uh, because we recognize that our, our state of education here in Colorado was already pretty dismal. And um, so with we had approximately a $578 million budget stabilization factor, also known as the negative factor. And um, so recognizing that that's where the state of education funding already was, we wanted to be very mindful about making additional cuts towards um, education. And then finally, uh, we were really trying to figure out how much federal assistance that we would be receiving from um, the CARES Act, uh, which came to Colorado, you know, it was a federal legislation that was passed. And, um, and so with those considerations, we went into the budget process trying to figure out how we were going to go about um, cutting $3.3 billion. At the end of the day, I think that we uh, tried our best. I think we did a pretty good job uh, recognizing that it's just the way we govern here in Colorado, which is we do not allow deficit spending and we have to produce a balanced budget. And that's what we did. So we put that forward to our colleagues. There were a couple of amendments during the amendments phase of the uh, state budget. Uh, but most of those um, amendments were not adopted into the final budget unless there was a revenue source. Um, in addition to that, um, I had a number of bills. In fact, many members of the legislature had bills that had to be um, set aside. Uh, because they had a fiscal note and we just could not afford to move forward with them at this time. So um, it wasn't uh, necessarily a judgment on the policy, but um, there were some good ideas out there that we just could not really afford to, to move forward with at this time, um, given our budget consideration. Um, in addition to that, we also uh, looked at anything that was a pilot program or a temporary grant program and um, any new programs that were just getting off the ground that had not been fully implemented yet. Uh, those were kind of the first areas that we looked at for cutting back in our state budget. And then lastly, one of our goals was not to necessarily remove any bills um, that had been passed by previous legislatures from statute, uh, but we just made sure that in this particular year um, that we reduced the appropriation or eliminated the appropriation uh, so that we could uh, balance our state budget. Um, when we came back, um, that was our number one priority, which was to pass the state budget as well as the School Finance Act. Uh, we have um, some uh, rules here in Colorado that our school districts must follow. Uh, they must be able to post their uh, budgets, their school budgets, for the public to be able to comment on and for um, their educator associations to be able to react to. And um, we needed to get that School Finance Act passed as quickly as possible so that they could uh, fall under those guidelines um, to be able to put their budgets out. It was hard for school districts to know what to do until the legislature uh, decided what we were going to do. Um, in addition to that, we also prioritized bills that would really help with COVID relief. 
Um, I carried a number of those bills, a couple of which I wanted to highlight for you today that um, are very specific to business. Uh, the first uh, one, I actually think when we um, started this broadcast, that uh, I heard from uh, Carabas. Um, so uh, one of the bills that I um, helped sponsor was to go ahead and extend the alcohol to go provision, the executive order that the governor um, uh, signed and, and released uh, while we were doing our stay at home. Um, the purpose of extending this alcohol to go uh, bill really truly is, is to help our restaurants kind of get off their feet um, and, and back into recovery mode, particularly given the fact that um, a, a lot of uh, sales come from, from alcohol sales. Um, our restaurants are just not going to be able to open up at full capacity right now, um, given the social distancing requirements, especially for our smaller uh, mom and pop stores that just don't have the space to be able to um, bring uh, people back at full capacity. And so we wanted to go ahead and extend this provision. Originally, the bill um, extended it for two years, but we received some feedback and some pushback uh, from the Colorado uh, Beverage Association. And so uh, we went ahead and dropped that down to one year. Um, and we're hoping that that um, is, is enough for our restaurants to, to really continue. I would have liked to have it at two, but um, part of uh, legislating is, is finding good compromises. So that was one of the compromises that we had to make. Um, a second bill uh, that I sponsored that um, uh, was uh, very much at the end of session, is a small business recovery loan program. Um, this is known as CLIMB, and it's being offered through um, our Office of Economic Development here in, in Colorado. And it's very similar to the federal PPP program, uh, but it's Colorado-based, and it's really meant to get at those uh, medium and smaller size uh, businesses that really kind of got cut out of the PPP program because it, it went so fast and some of the larger corporations and companies kind of snagged the money quicker. Um, and so uh, this, this was really meant to be a Colorado-based solution to try and help with that. And then um, lastly, I had um, two or three bills actually um, uh, two bills that were called out as uh, among three of the biggest uh, wins for business this session by Colorado Concern. Um, and one of them uh, offers its House Bill 1002, which extends college credit for work experience. And we really feel that this bill is going to help um, students uh, gain some credit uh, while they are in high school, for example, through their internship programs with businesses. It also helps our non-traditional uh, students who might be going back for uh, a degree, um, but have been in the field uh, for, for quite a while and have gained um, an enormous amount of on-the-ground hands-on experience. And so this bill will help make um, a second secondary and post-secondary education much more affordable uh, for, for students that are looking to obtain um, a, a college degree or certificate. And then secondly, um, the last bill that I'll call out today is a bill, it was 1039, uh, which is um, a program that really helps um, bring to light uh, rules that affect businesses. Um, uh, when we pass laws down at the, the state capitol, um, there's a rulemaking process that goes with that. And a lot of businesses are just not aware of the legislation that passes or the change in rules and how that's going to affect their businesses. And so um, we put together this transparent web portal program. Um, we're going to uh, put together a, a study committee this year to figure out how best to be able to push that information out and to make it much more accessible to businesses so that you know what's what. Um, it's, it's very difficult. I, I know most businesses would like to be compliant, but if you don't know that the rule exists and or if you don't know how to adjust things, it just becomes more costly for your business, um, especially if you don't even know that it's there. Um, so we wanted to make the that whole rule making and um, new legislation much more readily apparent 
for businesses. Um, and uh, I was really pleased to be able to, to carry and pass that bill this session. So I'll go ahead and wrap up there so that we can open it up to any questions that you may have. Um, it was a very difficult session, but uh, we managed to get through it. And I think that the legislature really, truly tried to come together and do the best that we could, um, given just how drastically the circumstances changed for us in, in the middle of session. Absolutely, and difficult to say the least. I mean, uh, we started off by sharing how much uh, we would have had in revenues and then the, um, the the billion in deficit that you all had to deal with. For those of you that have just now hopped on, we have Senator Zenzinger, who represents Senate District 19, uh, covering Arvada and Westminster. She's given us a nice recap of a couple of bills um, that she has been privy to, um, the actual buzz budgeting process, and she sits on that committee as well um, and some other highlights from session when it had reconvened post COVID um, or after the initial spread of COVID. A lot of the comments and bills that were referenced, I was frantically typing in there so I was multitasking and listening to our Senator but I've also included that into the comment section of this broadcast so you can be able to reference it as well. Quick shout out to Ann Hogan, Dave Carpenter, and Sheriff Reigenborn. Thank you for hopping on with us. We do have one question that's come our way, and this comes to us from Dave Carpenter. Dave's question um, is in regard to um, transference of cash. So I will go ahead and read the question and provide you an opportunity to, to share back on it. Um, would you please speak to the transferring of money out of the cash funds to balance the budget, how that affects fee-based government services, such as the Driver's License Bureau? So um, I should have mentioned this when I was talking about um, the reductions that we had to make with um, $3.3 .3 billion. Uh, we we made up those revenues in our state budget in a couple of different ways. Um, the first of which is just cutting back on, on spending of, of various programs. And that honestly um, makes up the majority of, of the budget um, uh, revenue de decline, the, the adjustments that we made to the budget. Um, secondly, we can also tap our reserves. That was something that we wanted to wait until the extreme end um, to do. It's never a good idea to draw down on your reserves, um, especially given that we truly believe that as bad as things were this year, they're actually going to be worse next year for our budget. So we didn't want to spend down too much of our reserves. Um, we were using those as an um, at, at the end when we needed to kind of close the gap. Um, the third uh, way really speaks to your question, David, around cash fund sweeps, um, available cash funds that we have. The majority of the cash funds that we um, did sweep into the general fund were um, cash funds that came out of reserves. So um, there is not necessarily a one for one with regard to like the Driver's License Bureau, for example. None of those cash funds were swept into the general fund because those cash funds are used for the operations of, um, of that department. Um, when we were looking at making those general fund reductions, uh, we didn't just the way that the state budgets work, we have 25 or 26 different divisions and not all divisions rely on the general fund portion of our budget as much as others. So for example, the Department of Revenue is one of those, the, those departments that has very little um, of their budget made up from the general fund. Most of their budget is actually made up by um, cash funds or, or um, federal funds or reappropriated funds, not general funds. And the legislature only has the purview over the general fund. And so when we were making reductions, we can only make reductions from the general fund. Um, and so um, when you look at the whole scope of things, that really the, the majority of our general fund is made up by five divisions. Um, that's K-12 education, which, say, which makes up the majority, almost 40% of our general fund. Um, uh, HICPUF, healthcare policy and financing, which is mostly Medicaid. Um, our third one is uh, human services, which is all of um, our um, 
child welfare system, our uh, youth corrections, our aging adult and senior programming, um, all of our foster care programming, um, that's, that's our human services budget. Our behavioral health programming um, all comes from human services. And then um, uh, higher education, which is a large portion. And then finally, um, corrections. When we were going through the process of trying to cut 3.3 billion, if we were to just for um, an, an example, um, just to illustrate the challenge that we had, if we were to zero out 12 of our divisions of their general fund portion, so like agriculture, revenue, um, the Department of Regulatory Agencies, um, if we were to uh, zero out uh, the Department of Veterans and Military Affairs, um, all, all 12 of those departments, if we were just to get rid of their entire general fund portion, it wouldn't even take us to half a billion. And we had 3.3 billion that we had to, to uh, cut. So while every department kind of did their share and, and we cut up to 20, sometimes 25% uh, from their department, the only area that we could take from though was their general fund portion. So um, those departments that are mostly cash funded, for example, we couldn't cut from there. And so the cash fund sweeps that we made into um, our budget were mostly reserves. Um, uh, like um, when we have um, vacancy savings, for example, that goes into a reserve account and those were the ones that we um, swept. Um, Fee-based um, cash reserves were, were not swept um, as much as um, uh, there's some penalty funds. So maybe if you um, uh, had a, a, a penalty of some sort and that uh, was not connected to operations and that was in some sort of a, a, a fund, then that would have been a cash fund that we would have swept. Um, the biggest one that we swept were uncommitted dollars from marijuana taxes. And this was one of the big changes um, that we did this year in the budget. Ordinarily, what we do is uh, we do not spend marijuana, marijuana money in the year that we collect it. We wait a year and we spend it in arrears. And that was because when we first implemented marijuana, um, uh, legalized marijuana in Colorado, we were the first state and we weren't exactly sure um, how that would go. <laughs> we weren't sure what the federal government's reaction were going to be. We were the first state, so we didn't have anybody really to look to. Um, and uh, so we really felt like let's go ahead and not spend that money until we know how much we have and then do it in arrears. Um, and so one of the, the budget uh, hacks that we did this year in order to help um, close that $3.3 billion gap is we went ahead and spent last year's marijuana money, just like normal, um, budgeted for that, as well as we projected our future earnings for our marijuana money, just like we do with all of our other um, revenue streams. And so we were able to capture two years worth of, of marijuana revenue in this year's budget. However, that's a one-time deal. You can't do it again. Um, once we've done it, you, you can't replicate that again. <laughs> and we had a lot of one-time type of budget decisions. Um, almost, I would say almost half of our budget um, uh, reductions came from one-time uh, budget uh, techniques that we can't replicate again. Um, so some of those cash funds that were swept into the general fund, we can't take next year because some of those have accumulated over um, many years and will not be replenished at the same level and or uh, we can't touch them because those cash funds are used for operating. Um, and so uh, we can't take them. Otherwise, we would be defunding uh, an entire department. So, um, but that was a really good question.
<laughs> Great question. Definitely a lot of information that was involved with that one. We have time for probably one more question, if that's okay. Um, this comes to us from Wayne. And Wayne's asking, you know, so there was a comment earlier about um, next year being a little bit worse. Um, why do you think that that will be the case? So first of all, what I was just saying about how we kind of um, use those one-time um, uh, options that will just not be available to us next year. Secondly, um, we did have about just a little over $1.1 billion from the federal government that we took into consideration to help um, uh, defray the cost of um, our public health centers. And um, our, we received a greater federal match, for example, on Medicaid. Um, and those um, enhanced matches, um, those enhanced revenues from the federal government will end um, at the end of the calendar year. And we don't know if we're going to receive another um, CARES Act uh, federal funding. So um, that was about a billion dollars right there, um, just a little over that we were able to, to utilize um, or at least account for. We were not able to take any of the federal money and use it as um, backfill for our state budget. Um, so that was money that we just um, uh, pushed out directly to the counties and local governments or um, uh, through savings that we got through the, the enhanced match. But we won't have that um, next year. And then um, a lot of it really depends on um, our recovery efforts. Um, also, I kind of mentioned earlier that we were reserving how much um, money we were kind of putting off, how much money we we're gonna take from our reserve. And that reserve did drop down. Um, uh, we ended up using um, about half of it. So I'd say about 400 million or so that we used um, through the reserve. And, and quite frankly, we used the reserve so that we would not have to um, end the senior property homestead tax exemption, which comes from um, revenues that are in excess of the Tabor cap. And we are really far away from the Tabor cap now, <laughs> um, almost $4 billion from the Tabor cap. So, um, but we didn't, you know, we were really reluctant to, to remove that, that, that benefit for, for seniors. And so we tap the reserve, which means that we have less reserve available for us in next year's budgeting process. Excellent. Thank you, Senator. And thank you to everyone that's hopped on. I see Carolyn and Sean Kaiser and a couple others that went ahead and came on toward the end of our broadcast. We are at the 30 minute peak of our time. And unfortunately, that means I can't hoard you for very much longer, Senator. No, you're <laughs> so fine. <laughs> For those of you that have tuned in with us all the way, I thank you so much. If you end up watching this video on replay, please give us a hashtag replay so that you, we know that you tuned in, you found this enjoyable, and also ask us any questions. I know that we started off by sharing everyone's traveling. Some people are a little bit off early. So if you end up seeing this broadcast later on, please feel free to still comment and ask questions, and we'll get those sent over to our senator. Thank you, Wayne, and to all of you that have tuned in and provided us some questions and comments along the way. And of course, our senator for being here with us. I hope you all have a terrific 4th of July. We will be back here at 11 a.m. on Monday with the mayor. So Mayor Atchison, if you have questions um, related to our city, what's going on, um, what they've done, or maybe initiatives that you've heard of, please bring them to that broadcast. And I hope you have a terrific weekend, Rachel. Thank you. Thank you.